OC World is made possible by the generous contributions of the Marisla Foundation, the Keith and Judy Swain Family Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you. Imagine California without its beautiful and world-renowned coastlines. What will happen to our communities, our environment, quality of life, and economy? For many communities, they don't have to imagine because they are witnessing it. Coastal erosions resulting from sea level rise, land development, and other contributing factors potentially affecting billions of dollars in property. This documentary explores what can be done and what are the consequences of inaction. Hear from residents, experts, and government officials as they share their fears and possible solutions. We in California have a special affinity for the ocean. And how could we not? This is paradise. The Beach Boys, many of whom ironically didn't surf, created an ode to Del Mar, Santa Cruz, Trestles, Manhattan Beach, Doheny, and more in their 1963 smash hit, Surf in USA. My native Hawaiian ancestors invented surfing, but California is partly where it exploded to become a cultural phenomenon. Corky Carroll, Robert August, and Herbie Fletcher were barrel-riding local heroes. This is home to the majestic vistas of Big Sur, endless walks on the beach, and not one, but two towns that call themselves Surf City, USA. That's my kid. He never slows down. Separate from our personal feelings toward the ocean, the impact of the coast on California's economy is enormous. If the Golden State were its own country, it would have the fifth largest economy in the world. Many of California's most populated counties border the Pacific Ocean to the west. The state's coastal counties account for roughly 22% of its landmass, but two-thirds of its residents live in those counties. The state's coastal economy is responsible for hundreds of billions of dollars in wages and nearly $2 trillion in GDP. But there's a problem. Various beaches from north to south in the state are starting to disappear. One place already under threat is California's iconic coastline. We have some drone video. Uh, check this out. These apartment buildings are teetering on the verge of, of disaster. These blocks of flats and houses won't be standing for much longer. Well, California is already experiencing the effects of sea level rise and storm damage on the coastline. At present, over 27 million people live in coastal communities in California. That's a lot of people. And nearly one million of these people will be at risk of flooding from sea level rise by the end of the century. This means that $8 billion of property could be in the sea by 2050. Another $10 billion of property could be impacted during high tides. And sea level rise is just one part of the equation. There are numerous other factors affecting our coastline. The end result could be catastrophic. Beach towns with economies that rely heavily on tourism risk losing beaches altogether. If sea levels rise multiple feet by 2100, which is possible, many of California's beaches could be gone, putting at risk billions of dollars in property. Rising sea levels are posing a more significant danger to California's future economy than major earthquakes and wildfires. The rising sea levels are gonna have a number of effects on California's coast. And the first and foremost is, is the erosion of the coastline. Um, as we see uh, sand depleted, and water levels getting higher, we'll see um, the energy of the waves coming off, the, coming off of the ocean 
impacting our cliffs, impacting our beaches, pulling more sand away from the coast, and shrinking the amount of sand that we have on, on the coastline. And, and that first effect will then have a whole lot of ripple effects because Californians up and down um, Southern California really, really you know, integrate the beach into their lifestyle. There are few places in which this is more apparent than the small California city of Pacifica, located between San Francisco and Half Moon Bay. The landscape in this picturesque area is changing. The city has been ravaged in coastal areas by rising sea levels. Powerful waves blast over the pier and onto roads. Cliffs are collapsing and portions of large hillsides are falling. A parking lot had to be moved inland. In one area of Pacifica, the ocean chipped away at more than 90 feet of bluff in less than a decade. The shoreline is shrinking as the city took drastic measures to armor the coast by building seawalls. They have the advantage of protecting in place something that you value, like, a, a, again, in state parks, a restroom or a parking facility that brings the public to, to the beach. But with sea level rise, you know, your, your seawall is static, and as, as seas rise, your beach is going to get squeezed. And eventually, you won't have a beach. Um, you simply run out of real estate. So you've lost that public resource. You've lost the ability of the public to enjoy it. You've lost habitat um, for, for many species. There's something else about the seawall which is um, not always appreciated is that once you put in a, a hard structure on say a, a sandy shoreline or any kind of shoreline, it increases the amount of erosion that's experienced at the toe of that wall. In Pacifica, major storms followed years of drought conditions, leading to several bluff top residences to be deemed unsafe. Apartment buildings on the bluff's edge had to be removed. The city is an operating budget dependent largely on property taxes of roughly $36 million. Dealing with the most recent El Nino cost the city $16 million. And Pacifica is dealing with the reality that other California coastal towns are now coming to grips with. The need for managed retreat, a process in which existing structures are moved inland to deal with the threat from the coast. Managed retreat essentially is the idea of moving vulnerable infrastructure on the coastline landward. So if you had a parking lot or a house or right on the water's edge, it's, it's moving it landward. And if best case scenario, you have space to do that and, and the money to do it. And one of the big drawbacks of managed retreat is, is the sheer expense of moving infrastructure uh, away from the coastline. In Pacifica, up in the Bay Area, the homes have actually been falling off the bluffs. So they're buying homes that are actually halfway. So the, on the one end of the spectrum is places where the erosion is so severe that they're already seeing destruction. So there's an opportunity to buy those out. Uh, if their property is big enough, we can move them back to the back end of the property and maybe buy 50 to 100 years. In other places, if there's nowhere to move, you know, that's where a buyout over time or some sort of abandonment is the only real choice to move back from the coastline. Gleason Beach in Sonoma County is a short distance from Bodega Bay, an area made famous in Alfred Hitchcock's fictional portrayal of swarms of vicious killer crows terrorizing a sleepy harbor town. In Gleason Beach, cliffside homes have fallen victim to the sea, and Highway 1 is uncomfortably close to the cliff's edge. Leaders are planning for the next century of sea level rise and determining what's worth salvaging. Caltrans, since 2004, has spent nearly $10 million on unsuccessful repairs and defenses. The remnants of these failed efforts are quixotic. This real-life nightmare is more terrifying than a Hitchcock film. In San Onofre, a surfer's paradise in North San Diego County, high tides, storms, and large swells eroded an access road at Surfing Beach. The state responded by building an 800-foot-long seawall between the road and the beach, upsetting activists and organizations such as the Surfrider Foundation, which proclaimed, Save the Wave at San Onofre. 
We have a lot of different kinds of beaches and coastlines in California, and each one is going to require a different set of strategies to adapt to sea level rise. You might even have one beach, for example, Surf Beach down in San Onofre State Beach, where we had a very narrow, vulnerable part of our access road that we ended up protecting with a rock prevention, a kind of seawall, but that allowed the public to access a much larger stretch of beach that, that we have no plans to, to alter and, and let nature do its thing. But under a sh under the short time scale, that seemed like the right thing to do to, to preserve public access. Long term, you know, probably not. It's probably gonna need to, to be removed because we're gonna eventually lose that beach. San Onofre is also one of the places on the coast that has had extreme erosion. And the beach has eroded back so far that they've had to move the, uh, you know, a temporary shade shack, the shack at San Onofre. They've had to move it back two different times toward where the road is because the beach has just been going away and going away. and. Capistrano Beach is a small Orange County coastal community that lies within the Dana Point city limits, just north of San Clemente. During storm seasons, flooding decimates this area. See where my son Mikey is standing? One would not be able to shoot a three-point shot from the western side of this basketball court because a crew removed that portion of it to view the damage below. The entire court is now gone. Fire pits palm trees, a wooden boardwalk, a volleyball court, and a restroom facility are also all gone. At Capo Beach, development, El Nino seasons, and depleting sand supplies are the other major variables at play here. Yeah, we saw like in that last El Nino, that 2015, 26 El Nino, we saw that region, you know, lose quite a bit of a beach. And then since, over the last five years since then, we've seen just a continual reduction of the, of the beach size. The sand is gone, you know, so the sand has been taken away. Now we have a cobble base and um, you're seeing infrastructure, it's being damaged and eroded away. And I think there's a few things going on there. One, you know, Southern California has really built out over the last, you know, 20 years, South Orange County is, is built out. And, and what that means is that the, the sediment is not flowing to the coast the way it did in the past. So we don't have the same sediment supply. Secondly, there's never been any big nourishment projects in that part of the coastline. Development, of course, has had a significant effect. The erosion, I think, had started really after the, um, after the sand from the harbor development disappeared. So when the harbor was built, we had something like two million cubic yards of sand, that's a ton of sand, deposited somewhere near the mouth of the San Juan Creek. And all of that sand migrated down and we had beautiful beaches for a good 40 years. And the problem is nobody had the foresight to replenish that beach. So, you know, no one was saying, hey, every year let's put, you know, a few hundred thousand yards in there so that we don't lose what we have. While Capo Beach is being decimated, so is the working class coastal town of Imperial Beach in San Diego County, just north of the U.S.-Mexico border. Imperial Beach is a low-lying town to begin with. Its highest point is only 40 feet above sea level. Thus, with rising tides, flooding is a major issue. This environmental instability could force individuals to move, leading to local incidents of climate migration. King tides occur when the sun, moon, and earth are aligned and create a gigantic gravitational pull. During the 2010 El Nino, king tides spread over Imperial Beach's sand berms onto the condominium area on Seacoast Drive. During the 2015 El Nino, the surf increased from three feet to seven feet and flooded the town with ocean water that was present on the streets for days. An Imperial Beach lifeguard captain told KPBS that major flooding that he used to see occur once a decade now occurs every winter. The beaches are also starved of sand here, which makes the issue even worse. The additional sand that is dumped here does not stay, and the town is using seawalls to protect itself. The Crystal Cove Conservancy operates historical cottages at Crystal Cove State Park in Orange County. These historical structures were built during the early 1900s, 
and the Conservancy is in the process of restoring them. As the Conservancy restores the cottages, it must take sea level rise into account. Cottages were built over the last hundred years in the beginning of the 1900s, 1915 to 1930 is when they were built. They're right on the beach. They're on a hillside um, that needed to be stabilized. So it took us, I, I believe it was about five years to get through Coastal Commission to get our coastal development permit. And the reason it took so long is that Coastal Commission takes this really seriously. They wanted to make sure that these cottages could withstand sea level rise. If we did not make these accommodations for sea level rise and for climate change, the cottages as they were built would not survive. There's no foundation, the boardwalk would be washed out, all of that would be gone. And in fact, it's one of the reasons that the restoration of these cottages, these last 17 cottages, is so critical right now and time critical because they're sitting right here on the oceans. Not far from Crystal Cove is Balboa Island in Newport Beach. This charming isle, home to some of the county's most wealthy residents, is well known for luxury boating, chocolate-covered bananas, and interesting artwork. It is a mess. When king tides, which are very excessive high tides come in, and we get them two or three times a year, maybe more than that, what happens is, is that neighborhoods and particular streets on the island, not the entire island, will flood. That's why we have to have the pumping crews out there to keep the storm drains and pumping the water back out. That's why we had to raise the seawalls. But it's not uncommon for several days for entire streets, uh, several uh, houses in, uh, to be flooded, uh, you know, ankle almost knee deep in places and for the boardwalk to be flooded. We have a preview of what it's going to be like when we have sea rise. The sea rise is about four tenths of an inch, we think a year. If we go to 2035, that's gonna mean six inches. And that's gonna be high. That's why we raised the seawall nine inches. We're still gonna have issues. We're still gonna have issues with king tides. And, uh, and it's very disconcerting to the property owners. It's very uh, damaging to the property. And we wanna protect that. Balboa Island is a, is a, you know, a resident, mainly residential island, some, some restaurants and shops there. Um, you know, it's, it's built on, on fill material. And it, Balboa Island land sits lower than high tides. So the land is low on Balboa Island. And in order to s s sort of defend that area from flooding during high tides, there is a concrete seawall that goes around the island and actually a wonderful path around the island where the public can go for a walk and, and take in the sights and see the cute houses and, and um, you know, see the harbor activities. So, so they just found over time that the higher high tides were going over the top of the wall and causing flooding. We are seeing danger areas up and down the coast. What is at stake if there is no action or a lack of adequate action? The urgency of combating climate change first comes to mind. What's at stake is, is a lot. I think that from a planning perspective, there tends to be a reactive process to dealing with coastal erosion and sea level rise versus being proactive. And unfortunately, this limits some of the adaptation solutions that can be implemented because it's all about timing. And when we have areas that are already experiencing high coastal erosion, like Capo Beach, that has a long history of coastal erosion, um, we're running out of options, right? So when we talk about the fiscal impacts or economic impacts of climate change on our coasts and coastal erosion, uh, I think this is one of these things, you know, I don't say this lightly, where it's really incalculable. It, we know it's going to be massive, but if you can just imagine uh, that where we're sitting right now, where, you know, Laguna Beach extends up to the hills, uh, where we have Newport Beach, uh, all underwater, uh, no longer inhabitable, what, what's the economic impact of losing uh, the homes, the businesses that are here, uh, the tourism that comes to our beaches and communities, uh, not to mention the weather-related phenomenon that's going to make our lives much worse. So, uh, you know, certainly in the billions, I guess, uh, and, and in the long run, probably much more than that. Some, such as environmental attorney Jennifer Hernandez, are skeptical as to whether we have the wherewithal to solve these problems. Do I think that we have the will to impose fixes? No. In the Bay Area, both of our airports, you know, big ones, the Oakland and San Francisco, 
are in areas that are going to be inundated. Do I really think we're going to allow inundation of San Francisco Airport and Oakland Airport? No. But we actually have a whole bunch of folks who think we need to manage retreat and just pull away as the ocean uh, and bay lap against those shores. Do I think that's going to happen? No, I don't think we're going to evacuate those airports. What do I think is going to happen? Under our current leadership, nothing is going to happen. People are going to sue each other. They're going to spend a lot of taxpayer dollars on money that is absolutely worthless on conferences and papers and studies. And we're not going to do a darn thing. We are squandering our time instead of investing our time and resources in fixing uh, not just current events, but fixing events or circumstances to protect future generations. What do we need to do? UC Santa Cruz professor Michael Beck offered four major suggestions in a 2021 LA Times op-ed. He states, we need to include environmental assets in national economic accounting, rethink public and private infrastructure investments, allocate more disaster recovery money to repair storm-damaged natural defenses. And finally, public and private insurers should expand incentives for natural defenses. Living shorelines can also be effective mechanisms to combat coastal erosion. A living shoreline is sort of a middle ground where you're utilizing um, materials like cobble and sand um, that can absorb and dissipate wave energy and those cobbles and sand can move and, um, and post storm event you can actually move that back or, or, or naturally it has a tendency to kind of uh, return itself back to a, a, a stable beach. Um, so that's beneficial because it re can retain some of the habitat value of that beach, um, but you're getting that sort of a, immediate line of protection from a large event, or in this case, sea level rise. Yeah, and you can work in um, some vegetation. You know, you can work into a living shoreline, some grasses, you know, some dune habitat that, you know, can also provide some benefits to the environment and provide some benefits during storms. And maybe sometimes, you completely lose that during a really severe storm. You might have all that stuff wash away, but then the idea is that if you have some of that cobble, some of that hard material underneath some of the softer material, that you would still provide protection for your assets that are further, further inland. Yeah, we're very interested in, in um, dune restoration type projects, living shoreline projects that have some vegetated dunes, because there is some science now saying that the dunes can rise up faster than sea levels rise. Those such as USC coastal scientist Melody Grubbs are carefully examining mitigation efforts in LA. The city of Manhattan Beach is implementing a three acre dune enhancement project near Bruce's Beach. Uh, the city of LA is working to install another nature-based pilot project at Dockweiler, which is a very commonly used beach. Uh, the city of Santa Monica implemented the Santa Monica Beach Restoration Pilot Project along with the Bay Foundation, a organiz nonprofit organization in uh, Santa Monica to evaluate how dunes react to sea level rise and coastal storms and if they can make the coastline more resilient while providing benefits to us uh, as flood protection uh, areas and also benefits to wildlife. And then moving up the coast, there's uh, the city of Malibu has implemented the Malibu Living Shoreline Project, which is also a dune enhancement project at Zuma Beach and Westward Beach um, to evaluate how dunes can serve as these kind of green approaches to sea level rise adaptation. The outlook for California's coast is dire, but there is so much we can do individually and as communities to get involved and become better protectors of the ocean. We will not be able to solve all the problems described in this program overnight, but we can all take steps, big and small, to be better stewards of the coast. 
I think the best way to become a public steward or activist for the coast and the ocean is to get involved and get civically active in your community. So you can do that through the Surfrider Foundation, you can do that through other community groups, but it's really about getting involved and getting active. There's things we can do as individuals, of course, but at the end of the day, it's about really engaging with your community. Every one of us has a voice. Every one of us has a pen or a typewriter or a computer. We need to start writing our legislators. We need to start writing our agencies. We need to start calling City Hall and demanding that we do something to address this issue. My primary thing is I want this beach to be around for my grandson. He's only eight months old and I want him to be able to walk on that beach. I want him to enjoy it. We need to be more mindful about what we eat, ordering fish, littering, using straws, things like that, just keeping it in our head so it influences the small behaviors we have and it keeps, it, it keeps us from doing those things that impact the ocean. Whenever we are out walking on the beach, it's picking up whatever you see, whether it's in the water, on the sand, pick it up, throw it out, clean up the beach and be good stewards. I want to be a good steward and I try to foster that idea in everyone and I agree with Karen. Keep the beach clean and be friendly on the beach and keep the beaches open. Keep our beautiful beaches pristine if we want to keep our planet healthy. Uh, I think the simplest thing we can each do is to try to minimize our carbon footprint. Uh, and there's lots of ways to do that trying to eat less meat, which we know causes GHG emissions. If we want to drive less and consider walking or biking somewhere, uh, con consider buying an electric vehicle or other zero emission vehicle, uh, turning down your thermostat. There's so many ways we can do this, but this is going to be a group effort. If we want to reverse climate change, uh, keep our beaches strong, our, our environment strong, uh, we just have to try to do what we can, each of us together. You know, the best way to take care of the ocean is to become involved and focus on what your elected officials are doing. Let them know your thinking and your, your input. And let's all work hard to make sure that these beaches are here generations from now. So to be better stewards of the coast and take better care of our ocean, we need to understand it. We need to learn about it. We need to understand what's going on, the species that live there, the environmental and physical and biological um, environment surrounding the ocean because one thing that I've found in my career is that we tend to concentrate and take stewardship and conserve and take better care of things that we understand and if we don't understand things um, we tend not to understand why it's important to take care of things. We need to go to the aquarium to learn about the fishies. Each of us has a role to play. We're all in this together. We need to be the change that we wish to seek. And if we seek cleaner air, cleaner water, a clean beach, and a coastline that's protected for future generations, then we all have to take our own steps to ensure that it happens. And if that means you vote for people that are more environmentally conscious, or you join organizations uh, that are doing their part, or you even go down to a beach cleanup and make sure that your own beach near your own community is clean, all of those are really important steps that you can take, but we're all in this together. In every crisis, there are always opportunities, and without sufficient and timely actions, the future looks bleak for the future generation. What do you think can be done to make sure we act in time to save our coastlines? We want to hear from you. Until next time, from all of us at OC World, stay safe and be well.